Well, welcome everyone on a uh, cold, gray, drizzly day to our workshop on public transparency, on keeping them honest. We have a great panel today of uh, two folks. One is Courtney Tanner, who is from the TRIB, and David Ryman, who is a partner at Tar Brownie and Loveless. So Ms. Tanner is a professional journalist who has worked for the Salt Lake Tribune since 2016. In that time, her reporting has won numerous awards and was important in particular to uncovering what happened in the Lauren McCluskey case, which I'm sure we all remember. Uh, in that and other reporting, she's made use of Utah's public records laws, uh, in particular, uh, grandma, as uh, we will talk about today. And in a thread, in fact, that she posted last summer, uh, I think it was this last summer, on the challenges that she was facing at that time of uh, navigating the public records uh, system in Utah, that actually was part of the inspiration for holding this workshop today. And uh, finally, I would be remiss if I failed to mention that she's a graduate of our journalism program here in the Department of Communication. And I had the honor of having her as a student. We're not entirely sure. We talked about it beforehand, maybe 2013, 2014, something like that. So it's, it's really an honor to have you back. And uh, we're all proud of uh, what you've been able to accomplish since you graduated. And then next is uh, David Ryman, who's a partner at the law firm Parr, Brown, Gee, and Loveless here in Salt Lake City. He has extensive experience with First Amendment and media law and has represented the media and individuals in matters involving the First Amendment and the public's right to know, including defamation, open records law, access to court and governmental proceedings, anti-slap lit litigation, online liability, anonymous speech, and related areas of constitutional law. Since 1999, he has helped staff the Freedom of Information Hotline at Par Brown, which provides pro bono assistance to the news media and citizens seeking access to government records and proceedings. Mr. Ryman was instr instrumental in the push to enact Rule 509 of the Utah Rules of Evidence in 2008, which enacted a reporter's privilege in Utah for the first time, and more recently has been heavily involved in protecting Utah's rule permitting cameras in Utah's courtrooms. In 2015, the Utah Headliners Chapter of the Society for Professional Journalists awarded Mr. Ryman its Sunshine Award in recognition of his efforts to fight for government transparency in Utah. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David, who I believe is going to go first. Yep. Thank you both for joining us today. We really look forward to your comments. Sir. <clears throat> um, yeah, thanks everyone for being here. I. Um, uh, we wanted to save some time for Q&A at the end, um, and uh, um, so I'm going to try to be, um, I'm going to try and be pretty high level in, in what I uh, um, talk about today with the, with the statute, but I, my perspective on open records comes as from my perspective as a lawyer, um, which often is a small subset of the things that Courtney deals with as a journalist, because sometimes it just doesn't get up to the to the lawyer level until it gets you know complicated and um, and so I'm hoping the two of us will be able to give you kind of a complimentary um, set of, of tips and tricks to try and get um, records but my perspective usually comes from helping people who are not law trained get public records and our statute is really designed so that you don't necessarily need a lawyer for these types of things and the hotline that we run at my firm um, is designed for that that we help journalists kind of self-help through the process, and I've done that. With, we've done that with Courtney, and and um, eventually, if it gets to court, you will need a lawyer. But most of them don't. And so, what I hope to accomplish today is to empower all of you with a little bit of knowledge as to how our statute works, so that if you want to get public records, whether it's for you know your classwork or for your your uh, profession after that, you'll have the tools to do so. Um, just one thing before we jump into it so that you know the difference, what, what we're talking about with GRAMA, which is the Government Records Access and Management Act in Utah. Um, access to certain types of government records, so not court records, but records that are held by all the other agencies, the legislative and executive agencies that do our business, is entirely a creature of statute. So sometimes you hear there's a First Amendment right to get access to government information, things of, of that sort. That's generally not the case when you're dealing with anything other than court records. Um, and so it's really important if you're going to use this tool to understand exactly what the statute allows. And so that's kind of what I'm going to talk through today. So we, we're going to start with a couple first principles because these animate um, what, uh, how the statute works. Um, 
This comes from a case called Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia, which um, was a watershed case at the United States Supreme Court. Um, it was decided just a year after they, the court had refused um, to open a, a certain proceeding in a criminal defense case, and the outcry in the, in the, after the 1979 term was so um, harsh that the court basically reversed course and recognized for the first time that there's a First Amendment right of access to court records. And like I said, that's not what we're dealing with today, but the, the sentiment that Justice Brennan wrote is, um, is important, and it's one that I think almost all people um, share, which is that we don't demand that our government institutions be perfect, um, but when we don't know or we are not allowed to observe what's going on, people usually assume the worst. And I, I say this all the time to government entities that are trying to, you know, hold things back. It's a lot of times as a, as a, if you're a journalist or if you're just a member of the public, you don't have an agenda as to what the government records say. You just want to know what they are. And similar sentiment expressed by one of our great former federal judges here, David Winder, um, that openness is kind of one of the principles that this country is based on. <clears throat> the important thing to remember about grammar, and this is true of pretty much any government transparency issue, is that it is always a balancing act. Um, there are going to be interests on one side of the equation that favor transparency, but there's always or almost always going to be interests on the other side um, that you need to consider. Um, because those are usually what the government is, is charged to consider. And if you get a record request denied, um, you, need to, uh, you need to take that into account. And in our, our uh, statute, the statute lays out um, some of these competing interests and says we're not, this isn't a, a law just to allow access to records. It's a law designed to create a careful balance where if there are interests that are legitimate, um, they can be considered as well as the interest in transparency. <clears throat> One thing that is interesting about this area of the law, especially in today's uh, <laughs> political environment, which some might call somewhat polarized, is that transparency tends to be one of those things that cuts across the entire political spectrum. There are people who care very deeply about it on the far left. There are people who care de very deeply about it on the far right. And sometimes the context changed a little, changes a little, but for the most part, um, it's something that most people agree on, that we're entitled to know what our government is doing. These are pictures from, this is going to be, um, so this is some years ago now, so a lot of you are going to be too young to remember this, but um, this was probably more than 10 years ago now, but our legislature is right when they started doing a bunch of text messages and emails to each other. And they decided, we're going um, we're gonna to pass a bill to amend um, grandma so that citizens can't find out what we're saying to each other on the floor when they're texting each other or emailing each other they, they cut out an entire um, provision of grandma that made those records public and they did some other things that essentially made it much harder to get government records and the outcry was insane um, it was a Courtney's paper published a front page editorial which is rare for a paper to do um, it was uh, the, the Eagle Forum came out in support of repealing this law, and the outcry was so huge that it was repealed essentially in the next, the, the governor called a special session and repealed it um, within a month, I believe, but it was really quick. Um, and so when you are doing this type of work and seeking these type of records, try and remember the best way to approach it is neutrally in terms of rather than having a political agenda, approach it just as government transparency because you're likely to have a much better um, result that way. Okay, just a, a brief outline on basics of grammar and how it works. The lodestar is that records are presumed public unless they're specifically classified otherwise. So the statute doesn't, it, we'll go through a couple things in just a second um, where it does go through and list categories of records, but if there's nothing in the statute that says this is a non-public record, it means it's public. And so this process is generally about finding out whether some of the exemptions in the statute apply. And it applies to nearly every government agency except, as I mentioned, the courts. And records is defined really broadly. So it, records, sometimes we think colloquially that means paper documents, but that's not um, how the statute uses it. It's any type of information, and that's much more important these days. It includes data and databases. It includes text messages, emails, um, all of that stuff. Um, so there are certain things, even though the presumption is that everything is, is public unless otherwise classified, most of the statute is, and here's the list of things that are non-public, 
But there are certain things in there that the statute goes to pains to say this is public. And it's kind of basic information that you would want to know. These are just some examples. There's more in the statute. But gross compensation, how much do our public officials get paid? Contracts that the government enters into with other people. Um, initial contact police reports are often very important for early reporting on crime. And final audit reports, um, which you may have seen some in the, in the news recently dealing with, with schools, that when there's an audit done of a government agency, the public's entitled to know what happens. Then there are the non-public classifications, and there's a couple minor ones I'm not going to mention, but the three primary ones are these. And it's important to know what they mean, because when you get a denial letter, it will tell you what um, the exemption is, and they fall within one of these three categories, or sometimes both. Um, and the, the terms kind of um, hint at what they're serving to protect. So classifications of private records deal with per things like personal privacy, medical records, um, social security numbers, things of that sort. Um, controlled, uh, and there are specific, specific, specific subsections in the statute that detail this. It's not just a general principle, although there are some catch-alls. Controlled records is something you probably will never deal with, but it, it deals more with a narrow set of mental health records that if you release them to the person who's the subject of the record could harm them. And so with that, we're not going to talk about that anymore because it's a very rare thing. Um, but typically, uh, if you're the subject of the government record, you know, if you're asking for your own file, you're not going to be able to say, well, that's private because it's your privacy interest. It's only when someone else is asking for it. But controlled is an exception to that. And then protected is the, the largest category, and it includes all kinds of different things. But the general principle is to protect an interest other than privacy. So, for instance, the big one here is um, the police will say there's an ongoing investigation, and so um, the record is therefore protected. Uh, or um, a business will say, I submitted this to the government because we're in business with them, and I needed to protect my confidential information, things of that sort. Those are kind of the three main records. Here's the process. That, has anyone in here ever submitted a grammar request before? A couple of you? Um, so here's the basic process, and I'm, I'm not going to get into the, the nitty gritty, but you, the, you initially submit a written request. And this has become pretty easy. You can now do it through what's called the Utah Open Records Portal and submit it directly to, um, to the agency. But it doesn't have to be done through that. You can just submit a letter. And the questions here are always, how is it phrased? Is it sufficiently detailed or sufficiently broad? And we'll come back to that in a second. Then you submit it to the agency that you think has the records. And you want to make sure it's the proper entity and the proper person at that entity. Usually, if you Google Open Records Portal, it will tell you who that person is. Um, then there's a response. Um, and in the response, the agency will tell you, is it approved or is it denied? Sometimes it's approved in part. Sometimes they'll say, we approve it, but we're going to charge you fees. Um, if they deny it, they need to give you an explanation. And if they don't respond at all within a certain amount of time, it's a denial. And we'll come back to a couple um, points of that in just a moment. And then after that, if you get a denial, um, there's an appeals process. And the appeals process usually involves at least one level at the agency. Um, eventually, you can get to what's called the State Records Committee, which is an administrative agency. that you, and not, Neither of those require a lawyer. Then eventually, if, you, if it does go to court, you, know, you can litigate it pro se generally, if you're, which means you don't need a lawyer at district court or in the Supreme Court. But generally, people tend to get lawyers involved if they can at that stage. And eventually, it can get decided by the Utah Supreme Court. So um, the last thing I'm going to do is run through some tips and tricks. And Courtney's going to go through some as well. And I'm curious to see how many of ours overlap. But these are the sort of things that we see sometimes um, that make it um, more successful for people trying to get government records. So um, tip number one, make it easy. The few things um, that I see in, in people who submit grammar requests that make it less likely they're going to get the records they're looking for, <clears throat> they submit something that is extremely broad, and they don't follow it up with any communication. So my advice to you is find out who it is that you're supposed to submit the grammar request to. When you submit it, give them a call um, and say, you know, uh, I'm happy to talk about this if we've asked for something that's too broad you know, let us know so we can talk, because you probably don't want to pay for a bunch of records you don't want either. Um, and uh, keep an open line of communication. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. 
Um, sometimes they have a form that this is um, a little bit dated because of the open records portal, but sometimes some agencies have forms for grammar requests, and if they've got one, that'll look more famili familiar to them. Um, tailor the request. That means don't ask for the world. If you want a particular type of information, the more specific you can be, the better. And discuss format. That means if you um, want it in electronic form, um, you don't want to pay for copies, then uh, tell them that. Um, so kind of an offshoot of that. Be specific. Here's an example of one that, that and this is also a little dated, but um, you guys were probably in elementary school or something. But in 2012, um, Salt Lake installed these, what everyone considered, newfangled parking meters that ran on solar energy. And everyone was freaking out because they couldn't put coins in the parking meters anymore. And they weren't going to work. And so there was a big controversy. So anyway, there was some grammar work that was done around that. And the top one is an example of what you don't want to do. All emails concerning the new Salt Lake City parking meters um, from 2012 to date. That's going to get you a bunch of stuff you don't want to know about. You know, emails about the installation schedule is this, or here's how much they cost. Um, what you're really looking for is something more like the second, which is all records including emails documenting complaints from users and others about the new Salt Lake City parking meters from their installation to date. And that gets right at what you're looking for. And so this just requires a little bit of careful drafting um, because you will get in, you may think, well, I want to be as broad as possible and cast the net as broadly as possible, but you're less likely to get a reasonable response if you do that. Um, other agencies, number three, sometimes um, the records are um, not at the agency you think. And um, this happens particularly with some executive branch agencies that are under the same net. And so two things about this, this issue. Um, if the records are at multiple agencies, don't be afraid to ask both agencies or multiple agencies for the records because they don't often coordinate with each other. And sometimes you'll get a much better you know, response from the Salt Lake City Police Department than you would from the county attorney's office or the AG. So think about where they might be elsewhere. And if you get a response back saying, we don't have these records, then give them a call and say, well, where are they? Because some, you know, they have to be somewhere. Um, and a lot of times they can give you some tips as to, you know, where to go in addition to that. Number four is redaction. This one is also very important because as you can um, imagine, some records have what is legitimately non-public information in them, but most of it is not. And so we see this a lot with police reports where there will be maybe the name of a witness or the name of a minor in a you know, five-page police report, but that's the only thing that's in there, and they're using it as a justification to deny you re the entirety of the record. They're not supposed to do that. They've got an affirmative obligation to redact. And so if you get a denial based on you know, uh, them saying, well, there's some information in there that is not public, talk to them and say, well, I, maybe I don't want that information. You know, we just want a redacted version that takes out that name. That's, especially with police reports and investigative files, that's a good way um, to get what it is that you're looking for. It also comes up if you're investigating a business that's doing business with the government, um, and there may be certain things that they want to keep confidential, but it's almost never the case that the entire record is um, confidential, although that can be overdone. So this is a memo that the ACLU got through a federal FOIA um, <laughs> uh, request to the, with FOIA is the, the federal um, uh, analog of grandma, and it's to the criminal palette section, and it, you can see what it is, and then it goes on, and it goes on, and this goes on for literally like 70 some pages. Um, all black. So if you get something like that, they probably have not done their job on redactions. But it is really important to say, if you get a denial, I don't, maybe don't want that information. Number five is challenging denials. So the denial letter that you get from the agency, if you do get a denial, is really important. And the statute requires them to put certain information in there. Um, one of them is describing the records or portions that you're not allowed to have. Um, the other one is, well, there's three important ones. That's the first one. The second one is citing to the specific statutory provision. So um, this will be really important when you decide whether to challenge it, because if they, they can't just say, well, it's non-public under grandma and leave you to look through this Byzantine statute trying to find out what it is that is the basis. 
for the denial. They've got to tell you specifically what section they're relying on, and they need to tell you what the appeal process is and the deadlines for that. So usually it'll say something like, you have 30 days to appeal to the chief administrative um, officer uh, of the agency, and that will give you your, your process for where you go next. Um, if they fail to respond, as I mentioned before, it can be a de facto denial. So they're supposed to respond within 10 days to any grammar request. Um, if it's for the public interest, you can request an expedited response. Anytime you're doing it for journalism purposes or to publish it, it's deemed to be in the public interest, and so you have five days. And there are certain circumstances if you've asked for a ton of records where they get some extra time. But if they don't act within that particular period of time, you can deem that a denial and appeal it. Number six is content is key, and I alluded to this earlier. Um, it is the content, not the form of the record that matters. It doesn't matter whether it's in an email, it doesn't matter whether it's on paper, it doesn't matter whether it's in a database, it doesn't matter whether, and this is also important, whether it's on a government employee's personal cell phone. Um, if they are doing government work on their personal cell phone or their personal email, and we see this a lot, um, those records are public and you need to make sure that they are being searched if, they, um, if you think that that's what's going on. We, we saw that a lot in particular with the Attorney General's office um, in, a, in a case that we handled a few years ago. Um, and uh, and the, the language from the statute, which is in that second point, is that the government may not use the physical form, electronic or otherwise, in which a record is stored to deny access. Number seven is the presumption of access, and I mentioned this at the start, but I'll just briefly hit on it again. Um, the presumption that records are public applies at all levels of review. So usually, if you know, you know, um, if you have a basic understanding of the way the court system works, usually when you appeal, it's your burden to show that the, the body below got it wrong. That's not the case with grandma appeals. The government always bears the burden to show that the record is non-public, and that stems directly from um, from the presumption in the statute. And then the last point, um, and this comes mainly from a Supreme Court case called Deseret News, which I'll, talk, I'll touch on in, in just a moment, but um, the, uh, if it's a tie, you know, if you're a baseball fan, you know, the, the rule of tie goes to the runner. In grandma, it's essentially the same way. The tie goes to the requester. So if there are equally compelling interests on both sides, disclosure wins. And that came from a case, and I'm not gonna, there's a lot of content here, and this is from another um, discussion, and I'm not going to go through all of this content, but um, the, it was a case where um, it involved a county clerk at, and I'll, I'll, just, um, I'll just mention this part of it, it involved a, an, a deputy county clerk in Salt Lake County, and he was accused of uh, sexually harassing a woman in his office. And um, the uh, report came back, they uh, commissioned an outside report, and the report came back, and he retired two days before the report came back. And the report, we believed, you know, sub, uh, substantiated um, what it was that um, he had done, but they decided they weren't going to make it public because they said it violated his personal privacy. And we, uh, um, and this was a big political um, problem at the time because the Salt Lake County attorney was a Democrat and this, this deputy county clerk was a Democrat and the Republicans were going crazy accusing them of in, inside cover-up. Um, and we uh, appealed it on behalf of the Deseret News and um, eventually went up to the, um, to the Supreme Court. And if you're ever doing any grandma litigation, this is sort of the seminal case in Utah on this because the Supreme Court essentially said the takeaway is we're tired of the shenanigans government agencies are playing with records. This, this statute does not contemplate um, adversarial combat over records requests. It requires the government to take a neutral um, view of the record and not its preferred classification and decide whether to release it. And that applies all the way through the case. So um, that's that case. Just a couple more. Fees, um, especially for those of you who are doing this as journalists or students, fees can be a big problem. Um, but the, the, uh, and, and the, the statute does allow you um, to request a fee waiver if you're doing it in the public interest. And um, you should be doing that if you're doing it for you know, activism or journalism or anything like that. But um, they don't have to grant those, um, it's discretionary. And so what they're allowed to do if they do decide to charge you fees is a reasonable fee to cover the actual cost of providing the record. That, um, if you ask for it in a different form, that can be higher. 
but they're not allowed to charge for the first 15 minutes of staff time, and it has to be the sort of lowest paid employee that, um, that can handle the request, and there are some details that go along with that. But the, the one piece of advice I give you on fees, if you're, if you're fee sensitive, is to say, I request a fee waiver, but if you're going to charge fees, contact me before filling the request so that we can discuss the amount. Um, and if you get a completely, because the last thing you want is them to say, you know, here's all the records you requested and here's a thousand dollar bill for all the time that we spent. So you want to, and sometimes in my letters when I know we're, we're going to have to pay fees, I'll say we'll authorize up to a hundred bucks in fees. If it's going to be more than that, then contact me because maybe we'll narrow it down. Um, a lot of grandma, and, and Courtney can probably talk more to this, but a lot of grandma cases die on the vine because of fees. So, um, so do what you can to try and keep that stuff down. Sort of a related point, um, don't forget about the free stuff. There is no charge for inspecting a record. And grandma allows you to do either inspection or um, getting a copy. And um, sometimes they'll say you, there's some staff time that's required to compile it in the way that you want it. Um, but if you're just asking for, to, to observe a record in the form that they maintain it, they can't charge you for that. So consider going in and asking for inspection. We talked about fee waivers. Um, and then the last thing here is that um, uh, make sure, I, I think especially these days, people want things in electronic form. And it costs a lot less um, to just copy a file onto a thumb drive. A lot of times government agencies will do that for free if you're not asking for something that is different from what they maintain. And then the last one, and I mentioned this a little bit, is um, consider an appeal. Um, I, you know, appeals sometimes have a way of pushing back on people um, that requires them to take your request more seriously. And they're not supposed to rubber stamp the review, although in my experience, um, you don't get a really an independent hearing unless you get to some place like the Records Committee, because otherwise it's being decided um, just by that um, agency. But, you know, there are, um, you, like I said, you don't need to be a lawyer to go to the records committee. Um, and uh, you can, and Courtney, I'm sure, has argued there before, um, and many of her colleagues have as well. And sometimes we coach people th through that. Sometimes we appear for them. But I think a lot of times you, as the person requesting the records, are in a better position to speak to why you want them then and what the public interest is than, than someone else. And so. Um, a lot of times, we did a case, that's the last thing I'll say, we did a case um, a couple years ago for, um, we were representing the ACLU and, and the Disability Law Center, but we were trying to seek access to jail standards that were used in Utah. And there was a guy who was profiting handsomely from them who drafted the jail standards, and he was, um, he was, uh, I'll just skip that, he was, um, uh, threatening these agencies with a copyright lawsuit if they released jail standards that govern the proceedings at jails, which seems kind of crazy. Uh, but anyway, um, several journalists and one at NPR or KUER in particular sent records requests to every county in Utah seeking these standards. And they just got, um, they, half of them didn't even respond and the other half just denied them. And so it really wasn't until we started fighting um, for them and took the case to trial in Davis County that they started taking it seriously. And so a lot of times you'll just get basically a brushback from a government agency because they think you'll just go away. And if you really care about it, there's lots of ways you can do this, but um, you should push back because sometimes they, and, and I understand that sometimes government agencies or employees are like, this is the last thing I want to do today. You know, it is part of their job, but it's uh, sometimes people see it as an imposition. And so if you make yourself somewhat annoying, then they may be more likely to deal with you. And that's, that's everything I have to say. I'll turn it over to Courtney. Uh -huh. I'm not very tech savvy. I'm glad that worked. <laughs> okay. Ooh, that's fancy. Okay. Um, so mine is a little bit similar to David's. Um, actually, I'm going to try this a different way. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, so I have some tips and some tricks and some examples that I've done. Um, and I like to think of Grandma as the Great British Baking Show. I don't know if any of you guys watch this. I like <laughs> got into it recently. Like really into it, um, but like, I like to think of it like this because they'll like throw some recipe at you that you're like, 
I don't know what a freaking biscuit is, you know, and, and that's kind of what grandma is. Like, they'll throw you some response and you're just like, I don't even know what to do. So hopefully this helps a little bit through that. Um, so I go ahead and want to emphasize that these are public records. Yes, I double checked this slide like 12 times to make sure I spelled public right and didn't embarrass myself. Um, but like the biggest emphasis is like, you don't have to be a journalist. Like, this is for the public, for everybody, for every person. Um, these are public records, you know, it's public information, this belongs to us. Um, so the, the emphasis too is, is a public institution, so that can be the police, that can be a university, that can be lawmakers. Um, I just want you to know that like, this is for everyone, this is for activists, this is for students. Okay, so I'm going to go into my tips. Um, my tip number one is be nice, which is hard for me because I'm not always, you know, in a congenial mood. Um, but my, my advice is to talk to an agency before you file a request. So like find the person there, like it could be the spokesperson or you know the person that handles records. Talk to them before. You know, find out what's actually there. They'll kind of give you some advice sometimes on like, you know, ask for it in this way and they'll know what that means. Or they might even give you the information without having to file the request, which has happened to me before and it's it's really convenient. You don't have to go through the whole process. And like David said, sometimes they have a specific form that they want you to fill out, and that's totally okay. Um, you know, most of their forms look the same. It's, not anything special, but if you use their form, they're, they're a little nicer to you, too. Um, be nice, and then nicely cite the law that's on your side. Um, so I usually say in my request, like, how much time specifically they have to respond. So, like, if I ask for an expedited request, I say, like, hey, you've got five days to get me an answer, or you have ten days if I'm not asking for an expedited response. Um, there have been studies that show that an agency is, is more willing to take you seriously if you, you tell them how much time they have. Um, I don't know, you know, if, uh, I haven't had that experience. A lot of times they, they don't actually respond in five days, but uh, try it, it's good. Um, if nothing else, it shows like you're serious, you know your rights, you know how grandma works. And then list all of your contact information. Some agencies are really prickly about this. Um, like I had an agency once that's like, you didn't list your email address, so I'm not gonna respond to you, even though I sent it from my email, so I thought that was kind of implied what my email was, but just make sure you list, you know, all of your contact information, because they'll be weird about it. Um, David cited this too. Um, sometimes it's helpful to cite some case law. Um, Mike O'Brien, that helps the Tribune a lot with, with um, media requests, has cited this and told us to sometimes put this in our requests if we're dealing with someone that's, that doesn't usually take our request seriously, and so it's the, it's the same quote from that court case. It's really good, yes, everybody knows that one. Um, this is really important. Know what you can request, what you cannot request, and what's already available. So a lot of times if you request information that's like already on a public site, the agency's gonna be like, hello, did you already look at our site? Because this is up there and you're just gonna like irritate them. Um, but know like what is available. So initial police reports are a really big deal. Um, this top one, which is not huge, um, Someone vandalized the Brigham Young statue at Brigham Young University. And so I requested the initial police report and photos, which was actually really convenient because they, they cleaned the paint off of it before we could get down there. Um, but they had photos of it. And so this story is actually just based on that initial police report. Um, and then a police reports that are completed you can get. If they're not completed, the agency is going to say something like, you know, it's under investigation. I'm not going to release this to you yet. So that's why you asked for that initial police report. Um, if the case isn't complete yet. We're going to talk more about communication, so you want to be specific in your request on that. Um, you should be able to get all like basic employment information, you know, what someone's job title is, what they make, how long they've been in the job. That's specifically outlined in the statute that that is public information. Um, you can get discipline in cases that have been adjudicated. So if like a police officer's discipline and like it's gone through like his appeals process, for instance, like it's, it's all the way through, then you can get like what the discipline was. And that adjudicated part is really important if it's like in the middle of the process of their discipline, you can't get it. And I'll explain some of that with my McCluskey examples. Um, contracts, really important. Um, I did this story, again, you can't really see it very well, but um, there was this $44 million contract that the state had with this test provider for standardized testing in K through 12. And it had a lot of glitches and they ended up canceling the contract and they had to pay for it and it was a really big deal. Um, settlements, notice of claim, again, that, that really came into play with the McCluskey stuff too. Um, but like if a, if a university settles a case, you, you can get a copy of like how much they paid out. Um, or if someone's planning to like sue a university, then you can get the notice of claim that they filed. 
um, body camera footage, um, a lot with finances you can get. There's so much data um, that you can request. And this, this isn't always like, I wanna like get dirt on people. This story is a data story. Um, I just wanted to know there was this new law that came into play um, on provisional concealed carry permits where people ages 18 to 20 in Utah could get these concealed carry permits, which was a new law. And I was curious how many people were getting them, you know, what the age breakdown was, like how many 18 year olds, how many 19 year olds, how many 20 year olds, and then the gender. And so then I did this story about like breaking down the data. Um, and then some court recordings you can get, again, court stuff gets a little fuzzy. Um, and then the list of no's, <laughs> don't ask for these things. Um, the second one on there, I will admit that I asked for that and I did not know. That was specifically in statute that you can't ask for like stuff around university presidential searches. It's specifically in statute that that is off limits. Um, nonprofits, you can't really ask for that, but they do put financial statements online. Um, student data, there's privacy with like FERPA laws, that's college and K through 12. Patient info, medical records, that's HIPAA. Um, autopsy reports, you can't get in Utah, but you can get in other states, which is kind of weird. Um, and then you can't make an agency create a record, and that's kind of important. Sometimes they'll come back and be like, this doesn't exist in the way that you want it to, and we're not gonna like create a file for you. And then federal records, which I'm not gonna go into, but I just wanted to know um, are available through FOIA. So like we've been doing some reporting on like um, indigenous boarding schools, and it's not really a state thing, it's a federal thing. So we've been asking the federal government for some of those records. Um, and then there was this investigation of BYU and like how they treat their LGBTQ students. Um, and that was a federal investigation, so we FOIA'd for those records. About communication, which I wanted to go into a little bit more, um, be detailed in what you're asking for. Um, because sometimes if you say like, I just want the emails of these you know, public officials, like all you're gonna get is the emails, but they communicate on different platforms. They communicate through text, they do instant messaging. I don't know how many of you use like, Teams or Slack, but you can request those because it's still government work. And so you want to be specific and say like multiple platforms in your request. And you can request, you know, communication from all sorts of people, the governor, lawmakers, school board members, you know, any public official. So on the flip side of that, you also want to limit your request. Um, this helps so like an agency doesn't like tell you like this is going to take 10 years and it's going to cost you a million dollars. Um, so kind of hem it down. Um, Set a reasonable time frame is kind of a big one. And if it's communication, say like what you're looking for and like who it's to and from. And then like a topic if you can. I couldn't think of anything, so I did the governor's toupee. So I, I hope Spencer Cox does not watch this uh, video <laughs> because I'm not trying to offend him. Um, but yeah, there, there's so much that you can get with communications that's really fun. Um, so like there was this weird smell in West Valley City for a while. Um, and so we did a request to see like what residents were telling the city. So like we did a request for communications for like any resident that had said like, I'm smelling this weird thing. And uh, it was really interesting. Like I think the, the start of the story was about this lady that bought like a million candles and it like wasn't getting rid of the smell. And so it was really kind of a fun story. Um, break your request into multiple parts. Even if it's like the same request, um, it helps if you kind of like break it down. So like if you know one part's gonna be like, really easy and they're like gonna get it to you and you know the statute, it's like clear, you know, I want this initial police report, great. But if you also want like communication on like that topic, I would break it into two just because you're gonna get that initial police report like first and then like you have, you can like challenge the communication later if like something comes up. Be flexible. <laughs> um, it shouldn't be an antagonistic process to request records, but sometimes it is. Um, it helps if you don't get like aggravated about it. Again, like I'm not very good at this. Like my tweet thread that Sean mentioned was, you know, a little heated, but it's okay. You know, he's like gotta try to like keep your cool. Um, like David said, offer that you're willing to like accept some redactions. Um, I hope that they don't block out the whole report. Um, <laughs> but you know, like if you don't need someone's name, you don't need a victim's name, like a police report, say like, hey, that's fine, redact that part out and I'll take the rest of the report. Um, try mediation with the State Records Committee's ombudsman, I always say that word wrong. Um, this has worked for me in one big case. Um, it's got a, I hate to talk about this, at the U, I'm sorry. Um, but when Miguel Darris, the police officer that was assigned to Lauren McCluskey's case, um, he had showed off explicit photos of her that she had sent in as part of evidence in her case. And I actually got those records through mediation. Um, I didn't end up going to the state records committee to fight for them. I like sat down with the U and we were like, 
let's work this out. And we did. And that's how I got that story. Be patient. Um, I put this Bohemian Rhapsody up here because this song is like 12 songs in one. And there's like the Galileo part and like the instrumental part. And like there's always another part of the records appeal process. Like you think it's over, but then they like come back with a solo, you know. Um, so just know that it's like this song and like there's going to be multiple parts. Um, you file the request, you know, your, your time passes, you're denied. You appeal saying, you know, like, this is why I deserve these records and cite the law where you can. Um, and then you're denied again, and then you appeal again, and then you're denied again, and then you go to the state records committee, and then you win or lose, and then it can go to court. And so it's like, it keeps going. It's a long process. Like, be prepared for that, but like, you're fighting for the right thing. So keep a spreadsheet. Stay organized. Um, this is just a piece of the records that I requested in the Lara McCluskey case, and I'll like go into that in depth. Um, but what I do is I say, like, what department I'm requesting it from, in my case, what story it's for, a description of what the records are, the date I filed it, the date they're supposed to get it to me, and then what happens in the case. Um, it just kind of helps you, you know, stay organized, know, like, when you're supposed to get a response back. If you don't get a response back, you can take that as a denial. And it helps in the appeals process, too. When you appeal a record, you have to like submit your initial request, all the denials, all the appeals, and it's the whole thing. And it just kind of helps you stay organized. Know your rights when it comes to costs. You can ask for a fee waiver. Um, again, if that's in the public interest, a lot of times, even like for journalists, it's not granted. Um, but an agency shouldn't charge you more than the cost of production of their records based on the salary of the lowest paid employee who can do the work, which is a mouthful, but essentially, if there's an employee in the office that can do the work, you have to take the, the person that has the lowest salary to do it. Um, you can also ask for an expedited request if you can prove that there's a strong public interest. And if you just put like, I deserve an expedited response because I want the records, like that's not enough. Like you have to say like, I'm using these to like inform the public in a news story or whatever you're doing, activism or, or you know, schoolwork. You have to like explain that. This is huge because this is like the most common reason that I get a denial. Who owns or created the record does not matter. If an agency has it, if an agency's in possession of a record, if like another agency sent it to them and they have it, then they have to give it to you. It doesn't matter that like it's not their record that they didn't like create it to begin with. Like it, it's, it's in their possession. So Okay, this is my last tip, and then I'll go into some examples. Don't be intimidated. Um, these are public records. This is your right. You're fighting for transparency. Um, you know, this comes at a really like volatile time. You know, the press specifically has been called the enemy of the people, and you know, we're not. We're not the enemy. Um, but you know, what you're trying to do with public records is show you know, what was done with taxpayer money, what was done with taxpayer time, what was done with taxpayer resources. And, like that's up to us as the public. We get to know that information. Um, appealing to the state records committee can be really scary. Um, you know, sometimes I've gone up, like, I've gone by myself and it's like four lawyers at the other table and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like, what have I just gotten myself into? Like, I know nothing. I am not a lawyer. Like, what have I done? But, you know, you're, you're fighting for the right thing and you just have to, like, prepare and believe and, and know that, like, this is important. And then this quote, uh, David had too, which is just really important. Um, it's all about openness. Okay, so here are a few examples. I actually never counted how many requests I did in this case until last night. So 55 requests um, in this Lauren McCluskey case. I don't even know how many stories. It's a lot of stories. Um, but some of the things that I asked for, um, I did some stories around Dale Brophy, who was the police chief. Um, I asked for his retirement package when he decided that he was going to step down. And also um, the invoice for the retirement party that the U threw him. Um, it cost $6,000 throw him a party and I got the invoices for that and the contracts that they had with like the caterers and, and what food he wanted and everything. You know, it's just an interesting story that they were, you know, spending this money for someone who there were concerns about how he handled the case. Um, I asked for a lot of communication, you know, between um, university officials, um, with the McCluskey family, just how they were handling things, staff discipline. Again, this has to be adjudicated and this was what I was like mentioning earlier is that it has to have like gone through the appeals process. So this took a little while in these cases to like get the information. There was a detective and a police officer that were involved in this case that 
both got disciplined later for how they handled other cases. So university, this story here, the University of Utah officer who mishandled McCluskey's concerns was disciplined for mistakes in another domestic violence case a few months later, and we got those records through asking for the staff discipline. Um, we asked for the media strategy that the U used. Um, I don't know where this one is on the slide. I think it's over there. Um, uh, no, it's, it's on the bottom. Um, they spent $60,000 on public relations on how to handle this, and so we asked for the contract on that. Um, I asked for a list of the staff and the start dates for everyone in the police department, um, and that kind of helped me kind of figure out who was in the police department, and then I went to the agencies that those police were at before they came to the U and asked for their discipline records there. So that led to this story that says, the police department built by Dale Brophy included leaders disciplined in other jobs, including Dale Brophy, who was disciplined when he was in West Valley City for pulling a woman's bra strap. Um, so that was a really interesting story to like, which started from a staff list, just asking who worked there. Um, we had a lot of women come to us afterward that said, you know, they had had ex similar experiences with police that McCluskey did. So we were able to ask for their police reports and that turned into this story about how victims were treated for years before McCluskey's killing. And then the notice of claim that I mentioned earlier, which is like the first step in filing a lawsuit. Um, we got that when Dale Brophy and Miguel Darris decided they were thinking about suing you. They didn't end up doing this. Their, the time has expired for them to do so, but um, yeah, so that's just some of the things that, that I requested that turned into stories. And then similarly, unfortunately, um, we have been reporting on the Jafon John case. And this is an example of like a really long process. This actually spurred the tweet thread um, of my, my wrath. Um, Jafon was killed in February. I'm sure you all know this. I'm not going to go through you know that whole backstory. But I requested records at that time from Salt Lake City Police in the U to see if she had asked for help before she was killed. Um, Salt Lake City Police you know, responded, gave me their initial contact report from their response to a domestic violence incident in January, but the U declined to give me any records at all. So that just kind of shows you, first off, the difference between two different agencies. So like Salt Lake City Police, you know, all the logging and the initial contact reports, you did not do that. So I appealed, and then I was denied, <laughs> and then I appealed again, and I was denied. Um, which often happens, you know, especially like David said, when you're appealing to the same agency that like denied you in the first place, like they're, they're probably going to deny you again. But, you know, you have to go through the process. And then I appealed it to the state records committee. I was initially told that the committee had a backlog, so my case wouldn't be heard until August, which made me really angry that it was going to take, you know, eight months to get records on this student and like to tell what happened to her. It eventually got moved up two months after I did a really long tweet thread about how mad I was. Um, it got moved in June, which is good. It still was four months after my initial request. Um, and I won. I won this fight because police reports, initial police reports, are supposed to be normally public under the law. I think it's specifically stated in statute. Um, but then the U also has 30 days to provide the records. So it is this like kind of arduous, like long, long process. Um, but I just like kept fighting this case because this was really important and the public deserved to know what happened. Specifically after McCluskey, you know, it, it failed to recognize that another student was in danger. Here is a short good example of a sheriff's office doing what they were supposed to do and I really appreciated it and I like want to frame this email. Um, I requested an initial police report um, in a case where a student had made threats to harm her classmates, um, I was initially denied by the agency and I appealed back to the same agency. And the chief there actually reviewed my appeal and agreed with my argument and gave me the records. It was really nice. <laughs> I really liked it. And uh, like I said, initial contact reports are supposed to be normally public under grandma law and I cited that and he was like, you know what, you're right. And it was a really nice email. I don't get a lot of nice emails. <laughs> so. Um, here's some, some examples of what my coworkers have done recently. Um, Brian Schott, who's a political reporter, did some requests on the security plans for Governor Cox's house in Sampy County and how much it would cost, so that's the top corner. Um, Jessica Miller, who is amazing and won a Pulitzer for the BYU work, she's recently done requests in every single state that sends kids to Utah Teen Treatment Centers, and it's been fascinating, very important reporting. And then Emily Anderson, who is also a U graduate in journalism, yay. Um, she requested communication about legislative interns and found this email from a state employee 
saying that like most of the female interns don't look like Miss Utah, which is like really degrading. Um, so that's in this corner, and that was spurred by um, Holstein Davis, and she wanted to dig a little further to see, you know, what people were talking about with interns. And last, um, I put Taylor Swift on there because she always gets one sappy song, so I get one sappy slide to say that transparency really matters, and I hope that these examples show you stories that like might not have come to light otherwise. We didn't request public records, and that people didn't push for these things. And you know, journalism is the fourth estate. Like we are checks and balances on the government, and the areas without newspapers or newspapers that close down often see more corruption in local government. And so it's really important to have journalism. And you can always send me an email. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Amanda Bynes or if I'm like really <laughs> dating myself with this, but she had this TV show where she was a superhero called The Procrastinator. And I'm not very fast at responding to emails, but I'll get to it eventually. So send me an email and I would love to like send you examples of appeals or like talk you through your process if you're like hiring a grandma and just like want a little help. So that's what I have. Thank you both so much. We have a little bit of time left. Um, if anyone has questions or comments or anything they want to throw out to uh, the panelists, feel free to do that. Yeah. Um, you were saying that sometimes there's multiple agencies like the Um, well, I'm not sure if, if it's been that exactly, but we have gotten different responses from different agencies because they, some of them, you know, take their grandma obligations seriously and some of them don't, you know, and so if you're looking for something, and I, police records is just the one that came to mind, but um, you need to think about, a lot of times records are not just with one agency, wow. they're with, um, they're with multiple agencies, and I, I just use the example of this particular attorney general's office has not been good in my view with responding to grammar requests and so if you're trying to get things from their office um, you know you need to think about whether they came from somewhere else because a lot of times their investigative files will be will originate with like a local law enforcement agency before they get turned over to them so that that was my suggestion um, there is a process where agencies can share records with each other um, under grandma that sometimes they technically do that, but a lot of times it's just that multiple agencies are working on the same thing, so. Yeah, and I, I think they also had some, eight months is very unusual, like that's, that's the longest I've heard of, but I think they had some turnover on their staff. But I, I will just make one short plug for something that Courtney mentioned, which is that, and I'm not sure who the ombudsman is, I, ombudswoman, I guess, it is, yeah, technically. It's, word, yes. it's um, just a terrible word to it is, it's a but, word. <laughs> um, So whoever it is, they have a mediation process at the State Records Committee, and if you, if you appeal it, um, they'll reach out to you and say, do you want to mediate? And a lot of times, the, one of the reasons I suggested talking yourself directly at the start was because a lot of times you're just not communicating well with the agency or what it is that you want. So I try and do that early and often, but if, if it gets to the records committee, definitely take advantage of that opportunity because a lot of times you can get sort of what it is that you want just by sitting in a room. They have a, a dedicated person who just facilitates those mediations. I, I haven't used the new person. The longtime woman, Rosemary Cundiff, who ran that, I think is retired now. 
Um, but I'm not sure who it is that you use. Yeah, Rosemary is what he's Okay, for. yeah, so I think she's gone. But, um, but that's their job is to try and resolve these things. So take advantage of that if you get up to that level. Um, and if you do go, have to go in front of the committee, um, sometimes there are lawyers there, but I guarantee you, you're going to understand why you want the records better than they do. And the records committee is not legally trained. There's usually like one lawyer, maybe a couple lawyers, but they're not on there because they understand grandma, to be totally honest with you. So um, they usually have, um, a, you know, they, I think that they tend to have some sympathy for people who are seeking these records, um, you know, and, and can explain why it is that they want them. And I've been there sometimes having to make really technical legal arguments that they're just, they just give the back of their hand even though they're right, because that's not the, you know, that's not their role. They're designed to be kind of this independent sort of citizen-led um, body that decides uh, records requests in vocabulary that you'll un all understand. So I don't think there's a reason to be intimidated. Sometimes they think if you brought a lawyer in, then, then you know, there must be something you're trying to pull over on them. I, it's not always that way. It's a rotating group of people, but it's, they generally try and do the right thing. So. So we, I'll, I'll throw one in real quick. So we've seen um, some stories, I think, in the last few months about this issue of vexatious requests for public records. Um, and did the did the legislature end up passing some new rules related to that? I'm not remembering, but uh, uh, what what counts as a vexatious request? Why is that being discussed so often lately? Like, where does that come from? And are there new rules that are making it more difficult to get public records because of that? Right. I, so I can speak to that unless you want to. So um, there is a bill that will run this session that will put this process into place in the statute. It came up last session, um, and for a variety of reasons, it didn't get put into place. There are a lot of people, and I tend to, to refer to these people as people who ruin it for everyone else, that, that um, are submitting, and almost always it's for their own personal financial reasons. So let's say, just hypothetically, someone is speculating on water um, rights in southern Utah. And they submit grammar requests all the time, um, at least once a week. They're asking for like really broad things. Give me every text message this person has sent for the last week, you know. And agencies, I think, are are understandably annoyed um, by people who have the right to request them, but they're um, they're sort of ruining it for everyone else because it kind of gives the agency a jaundiced look at all grammar requests. So what they are going to put into place is a process where an agency can go to the state records committee and ask that someone be deemed a vexatious requester. And there's a, to answer your question, Sean, there's multiple factors that come into play, but essentially it's did you submit them, have you submitted a bunch in the past, you know, what's your reason for doing this, are they unreasonably duplicative, you know, and there really are people like, like this who are out there that I think would be deemed vexatious requesters, but you know, that determination can be made by the, the state records committee and they can fashion relief and usually the relief will be, well, you don't have to answer requests from this person for, I think, up to a year, but that's the maximum. And then um, either side can appeal that to court. Um, so there are some safeguards in place. I think that just, we have talked about it over the, over the years as, as, a, as a problem, because I represent the news media as a problem you know, that would affect legitimate journalists. I really think that this process is not going to affect legitimate journalists, although we'll have to keep an eye on it because, you know, there are cases, like Courtney mentioned, the, the McCluskey case where you're submitting a lot of different requests. Um, but that's not really who it's aimed at. It's aimed at these people who are mostly property speculators and things of that sort. And I would say that I hope <laughs> that that ends up being the case, but I would definitely say that, like, within the Salt Lake Tribune newsroom, there is some concern and some lawmakers that are antagonistic toward journalists or that think that journalists are antagonistic toward, you know, public agencies and that, you know, we're just trying to get dirt on everybody, which is not really the case, honestly. Um, you know, a lot of times we're just filling a public request to see what information is there. You know, we're not looking for bad things necessarily if it's in the report, okay. Um, but we're just, you know, doing our due diligence. But there is some talk among lawmakers who have labeled some of us vexatious requesters. Yeah. Um, so there's there's concern. Yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I, 
there's been some talk as the in the discussions about this bill over the last couple of years of putting in an exemption for the news media. Um, it's a tricky policy question whether you really want to start doing that, and then it raises the question of who is a journalist and are you leaving out you know bloggers and, and things of that sort. And so we've resisted doing that and other laws that we've passed here. And so that's kind of the the trick. But if there were if the someone were to try and label a you know a reporter from the Salt Lake Tribune as a vexatious requester, it would be a big big problem. Um, and just because they're trying to do their job. And I, I have to think that hopefully the process would work its way out as far as that goes. But we'll have to see because, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of gotten to the point, Sean, where like they, I think they felt like they needed to do something or, or is going to be something worse, where they just start cutting off. You, you know, a person can only submit this many grammar requests, period. No matter who they are or what they are, that type of thing. And, and so, you know, it's, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I think we'll get some more clarity um, at the end of the next session in March. April. And one thing that's worth adding too is it does feel like recently there has been a push to, to block reporters more. I mean, there was the bill, I can't remember where it ended up, but the, the measure to keep reporters off of the House and Senate floors, yeah. um, which, you know, blocks access. And, and so there have been efforts recently to, to limit where reporters can go. Yeah, and that actually wasn't even, a, they didn't even have to pass a full bill for that. They just had to pass a resolution. And um, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but they, Courtney can speak to it much more than I can, but um, I know we're out of time. But I, I think it's really important to be able to get timely access. And so there's been, and this was sort of um, something that was precipitated by Trump and during the Trump era of this, this really serious distrust towards and you know hostility towards the media, and it's carried over, and it carried over here onto the floor um, of, of legislators thinking that the journalists are just trying to play a gotcha game and catch them on a hot mic, and that's not the case, obviously. But there's no right to be on the floor um, of you know the legislature, and so they've, they've barred access. And I don't know, I, I heard that it affected reporting last session um, to some extent. I don't, I don't know if they'll have changed it this time around or not, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all for attending. Thank you to our panelists. This was a great event, very informative. And uh, yeah, thank you. Have a good day.